So I'm going to go through and start testing all the caps that were pulled from the unit now. The test is going to consist of capacitors first and then leak down. I finished testing the capacitors and, and it can be very deceiving and this is why you shouldn't use a capacitor test to, to measure the uh, performance of a capacitor alone. These are 9.1 and 9.2 for 10, right? So that's good. And this is for uh, 50 and 50. I'm showing 51, 53, 57, 53, 54, 52, 51, 51, 54, 54. And this is the only one that I could not get a reading off of that, that was showing it to be dead. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, that with the exception of this one that's completely dead, uh, all these ones that show a uh, good capacitance reading, uh, how they do in terms of performance when we start running some uh, DC voltage through them, uh, where they leak down at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to test these. I'm going to annotate what the uh, leak down voltage was, what setting it failed at. You know, th that's basically a representation, and I'm going to leave it right there. I've cut short this capacitor testing and I'm gonna tell you why. I think I've determined what happened to these based on the uh, observations that I've made here. If you were to take these capacitors and hook it up to this device and bring it up to its maximum voltage or ramp it up to its maximum voltage, what you would find is uh, an extremely high amount of DC leakage. Uh, this is limited, of course, current limited. And given enough time, uh, it would rebuild, and they rebuild significantly. I'm talking an extreme amount of time. If you were to use the method where you would slowly bring them up, they would get up to about about 100 as an operational capacitor, a good working capacitor would before they just start to leak excessively. Uh, given an hour or two, they would get up to about about 400, maybe 450. What I think is, is that this amplifier sat for an extremely long amount of time unused and these capacitors were completely broken down. And when the amplifier was fired up, uh, a ton of current went through them and caused them to boil over. I think several fuses were used as fuses blew and they just got worse and worse, hotter and hotter uh, before Obviously, this had happened, right? So when I inspected them, uh, because this was a, a short event, the, the capacitance still read good. And if I slowly turned them up, even ones that were, were damaged, uh, this one actually had a reading that was far off from the original value, but did have a reading, uh, did actually uh, hold a, a, a decent amount of uh, voltage here before it leaked DC. I think God, this one got to like 300 something. Right, so very interesting. If you spend a lot of time to rebuild these, they actually did pass muster. But if you initially fired them up, they did have excessive leakage, and that would have been a lot of a lot of power uh, that these things would dissipate given the voltage that that was used. So, I think that was a problem. This is why these all failed. This is not to say age wasn't a factor too. I think some of this stuff, like we see on the bottom here, may have been developing over time and probably wasn't part of a singular event, right? As we see here as well. But when I look at something like this, I believe this was probably part of a singular event that happened when this amp was brute force turned back on and, and multiple fuses were put in to try and keep the thing going. This thing got really hot and boiled over. So now I'll be putting in a one amp fuse back into the unit. Instead of a dummy load, I'll be using my little test speaker, my 8 ohm speaker right here. This will also let me check to see if there are any artifacts coming out of the amp. I'll have an audible indication. We're going to be using the Variac on the isolation transformer with the kilowatt to measure the wattage as I uh, do a smoke test of this unit. I'm going to have to borrow a couple of test EL34s off of the ST70 until I could get a new pair of EL34s for this unit. And I'm going to be inline testing at least one of those EL34s to see what the current is on that tube. 90 volts showing 30 watts and dropping as the tubes heat up. See the filaments glowing. Uh, this is a good sign. I do have the um, the tubes at standby right now. We're at 98 volts, 100. Okay, so we're at 107, just low voltage right now. Seeing 40 watts. That's healthy. Let's get on point. Now we're at line voltage. 
50 watts in standby, line voltage. Everything looks healthy. I'm gonna let this sit for a few minutes just like that, not even disturb it. So before I do anything uh, with regard to taking these out of standby and I, I check the filament voltage AC is looking good on the power tubes here. I just wanted to have a quick look and see what the bias is, make sure bias is function. I see neg 37.4 and, and that's tied across all of those right there. So that looks good. Of the circuit, I see neg 37.4, just different colored wire. Here we can take it out of standby, see what's what. And immediately we could see uh, current flowing is uh, 32.5. I'm gonna leave that alone right now for the purpose of testing. It's, it's nothing crazy, I could work with that. 418. I'm gonna make sure the sweep of the pot is good. Just move back and forth just a little. See, the deflection is nice. Sometimes they get gummed up a little bit. I'm just gonna leave it at 30 right now, something conservative. We're gonna give it a little bit of volume. So here's something I noticed right off the bat. Um, a lot of crackling and crunching when it turns on. You can hear that right now? Here you go. There we go, there's an example of it. And I, I didn't know what section it was in. Uh, another problem I had noticed with this amplifier, and that is I've got uh, an input right here, just floating. And I'm gonna touch it, I got nothing. Crank this volume, you can hear a hum, a terrible hum. And when I adjust the preamp, right, there's no effect, no effect at all, right? So I'm thinking something's floating in the preamp stage. The amplifier stage is not affected by it, so it's isolated. This amplifier's cut in half. So what I did was quite simple. I, I did it off camera. It was, I just, <laughs> I just pulled out the preamp tube, right? And I'll show you what I did. I'm gonna, I'm gonna replicate this. I'm gonna turn this up loud enough so you can hear it hum. Here we go. We got a nice hum. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring the preamp up a little bit right now. I'm gonna pull the preamp tube out. This is the second stage preamp, by the way, not the first. The hum is gone. I didn't get on the first shot. I did the first stage first and then the second. Drop in new tube. Again, we're gonna have a lot of noise. This is floating, right? But now, preamp knob works. So we're in business. And with this, I could probably set the hum circuit Right about there, minimum hum. I'm gonna pull the front. I'll do the up to the ear test, which can't be heard on camera, but crank it up. Yeah, I was on the money. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so that's set up. Outstanding. Let's hook a guitar up to it, see what we got.
we're going to start with the uh, biasing event of this amplifier and that's going to start with the reading of the plate voltage now that I have all the voltages dialed in come off pin 3 of EL34 we're looking at uh, 432 433 volts yeah we'll say 433 volts we'll put that into our calculation I don't think I want to run it the full 70 maybe 65 percent of dissipation I'll see what we come up with so I'm gonna run it a little bit conservative uh, 65 percent instead of 70 uh, that's 16.25 watts uh, per tube and that's going to be divided by 433 is going to give us 0.037 is uh, 37 milliamps so we're just going to bias for 37 and then what i have to do and i realize that i'm using uh, some of my tubes in here this is going to have to be redone uh, when i uh, get some new tubes for the other pair but i just want to see how close they are aligned to each other so we're just going to uh, go and do that now right quick and that means having to move this test set over to the different slots. So right now we're at 27. I'm just going to bring this uh, to 37. So there we go. Now I just have to move this test set to the other tubes. I moved the tester over to the second tube of my set. This one is also uh, 37, you know, fluctuating to the 10th. But this is a match set, so they're awfully close. So I'm going to move over to the other two tubes that are originally from this amplifier, see what we got. Now as you can see, we're on to that top pair now. And we can see the first on that top set is 42. That's off by 6 milliamps and stands to reason because it's not part of my match set. This one from that match set is not matched either. This is showing 40. Uh, the other one was uh, 42 and change, I believe. So yeah, not so much matched. I'm going to take the third one that was pulled uh, that was good from the original match set and see what that value is. So I got that final tube coming up now. We'll see what the verdict is on this one. This one looks like 40 and a half, so we had one outlier on those. Probably better just get a four match set for this amp and be done with it than try and go and rummage around and find two more tubes that would match this thing. That's just my opinion. I'll kick this back to what they want to do. The replacement tubes have arrived, so we're going to uh, put these in, starting with the 12AX7. And I'll be dropping the old tubes back in the boxes as I return them to the owner. We can see that this quad set has been matched from Tube Depot. They're marked 37. So we're going we're gonna to make sure that that's right when we do the biasing. All the new tubes now populated. I'm going to turn this on and let this cook for a while. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bias it just to make sure the bias is in the ballpark, and then I'm going to leave it alone. Yeah, I'm bringing that down a little bit. So I'm going to let this run for a while. These tubes are brand new, so they're going to drift, and uh, I'm going to come back and see which way it's drifting. So it's down on 37. I'm going to leave it be. I'm giving this tube back, but I have taped around the pins so it can't be plugged in and annotated it as a short, just in case everyone check it out for themselves, maybe for educational purposes. You know, I always return the parts, but I'm saying don't use this tube. It will destroy whatever amp you plug it into. I think fair warning has been given. I've let it sit for a little while. I I've set it back at 37.0 in and around here. And since the current's not drifting too crazy anymore, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through uh, all four of the tubes and, and switch this meter and just make sure that they are in fact matched I'm going to shut it down, move it to the next one, turn it back up, and see that everything is doing okay. So I'm going to do that now. So I got 37, 35. This one here is showing 39. This is not the most wonderful matching job on the planet, but I, I didn't expect too much from them. At least they're in the ballpark. And I'll hit the fourth one now. This last one's showing 32. Uh, given how these two are 39 and 32, being how these two are the uh, extremes... I just want to switch them in their sockets and see if it follows the tube or follows the socket. So I'm going to try that now. So now I'm on the same tube. I've just dropped it down one socket, fired it right back up. We're going to see what we get. I expect, of course, it's the tube, but I have to check anyway. That's 32 milliamps. And again, for good measure, this one swapped is in and around 39. So follows the tube just for good measure, so nobody can say I didn't check. So these tubes, which they have pre-checked to be uh, matched, are not so matched when checked in the amplifier. 
For reasons I don't want to get into in this video and speaking with the distributor of the tubes, I ended up going with a uh, combination of what's mostly the old tubes and a new tube. And based on that original 37 and measuring these tubes against it, I came up with 34, uh, which is actually 34, 35, and 35. So what I'm going to do now is take that 34, put the tester on it, bring that back up to 37, and then measure these three one more time, make sure everything's okay. I should have everything biased now. So now I got that first tube back on 37. I'm gonna move over to the next one. Second tube is also 37, very nice. Third tube sitting at 37 and a half, outstanding. Fourth tube is sitting at 37.8, that's just fine by me. I do call that 38, right? So this is, this is, yeah, this is looking real nice. I'm gonna call the biasing done for this amp and we're looking at, again, so look at that 65% plate dissipation. It's exactly what I wanted. We're gonna put this amp back together now we're done. And we'll just take one more quick look at this amplifier after the work has been done. Caps have been replaced, couple tubes have been replaced and everything has been cleaned up. We'll put it back in the chassis now. It's important that you walk this one in carefully because the metal retainers will get caught on that uh, metal piece that lines the bottom of the cabinet. Back in the chassis, this is one of the more difficult ones to uh, reassemble. Uh, the, besides the fact it's really heavy with the clips, everything has to be just right. And if you knock a clip through, you gotta take the whole thing back out. You gotta be really careful how you put that back together. It could be a real pain. I'm gonna put the uh, covers here, the shields back on these tubes. And then we're gonna put the uh, cover back on here. There we go, it's all buttoned up and finished. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the maintenance and repair of this JCM 800 Lead Series Marshall Amplifier. Thanks for watching.